Pandemic, war, social upheaval giving way to new social mores, political movements, and economic debates. Huge shifts in the broad acceptance of LGBTQIA+. Or rapid changes in fashion that coincide with gender nonconformity and fluidity. Fear and fights against fascism. Is it the 1920s? or the 2020s. Okay, now last dose. About a month ago, I spent two weeks covering the costume history course at Indiana University's theater department. For those two weeks, we covered basically 1915 to 1949. And while I was doing the research for the 1920s, I became increasingly aware of the discourse around flappers and how similar it actually is to how we talk about Gen Z today. So much so that, well, I have a hill. I have a hill, I'm camping out on it, guys. Gen Z are the flappers of this century. Bounce, bounce. And no, it is not because Gen Z and flappers are the young people or that it's 1920s and 2020s. No, 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 it's much more nuanced than that. It's more about how Gen Z is interacting with the world that they're coming of age in in a way that is eerily similar to how flappers, both female and male, interacted to the world that they were coming of age in, which is drastically different than the world that they were born into. Oh! <laughs> Dangerous. This video is sponsored by Ritual. So if you're not familiar with Ritual, they are an obsessively researched multivitamin company for men, women, postnatal, prenatal, teenagers, over 50, not over 50, but not a teenager, me, company that provides just really high quality, like daily multivitamins. Instead of like having like one like super chalky vitamin or like having to take multivitamin, like multiple vitamins or supplements, you can just take two of these like once a day and like you're wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, good to go, right? What I actually really like about them is that they have vi like vitamin D is like the first thing listed on here. And I personally like blood tested, do not produce a lot of vitamin D. So when I saw that these have like vitamin D and iron in them, I was like, sign me up. This sounds amazing. Cause your girl needs some vitamin D. Don't make a dick joke. They're also really safe for basically everyone to take. They're vegan, they're GMO free, they're gluten free, they're allergy free, they're sugar free. So it's just the vitamin. Everything is supposed to be pretty easily to digest. And then that little cool mint tab in them like really does keep them like tasting super fresh. So when you taste them, it doesn't kind of have that like medicinal vitamin -y tasty. So they have been extensively researched. And when you go to the website, you can actually read all the ingredients, where they come from, all the research and everything else. In addition to the vitamins that they've launched that I've already mentioned, they are also now launching their essential protein line. So if you are someone who needs to have protein in their life and you're not eating enough through your normal diet, you can also add on the essential protein powder. Better health doesn't happen overnight. It is a process. I know this very intimately. Ritual is offering 20% off their first month of a multivitamin purchase. So just go to ritual.com slash Abby20, all caps, and use the code Abby20, all caps, again, to get 20% off your first month of Ritual's multivitamins. And if you want to fill in the gaps for your diet, get the Essential for Women multivitamin pack. That's the one that I've been using and I really enjoy it. And that's just one small step to setting a good, healthy foundation for your body and your mind. So with that, I want to thank again Ritual for sponsoring this video. Some more about flappers, huh? Its after-war significance entangled itself with the dreadful side of youth, with jazz, short skirts, bobbed hair, and glistening legs, with the immodest passing of corsets, with cigarette smoking, with petting parties, and gasoline buggy riding, with psychoanalysis, Greenwich Village Follies, and Ziegfeld Chorus Girls, with one-piece bathing suits, with so-called modernism in art, with the intellectual manners of Mrs. Asquith, with the exposing and slandering of old fogies, with birth control and eugenics, with Bolshevism, both the parlor variety and the Russian experiment, or with anything else that the newspapers happened to be full of and the older generation of the ultra-conservative sort didn't approve. Eliminate Flapperism, Male and Female, Ladies Home Journal, October 1921. This quote captures the spirit of the 20s and of the flapper. You know, a youthful, highly fashionable young woman who plays with gender nonconformity, sexual, mental, and physical freedoms, socialism, and art. But when we think of flappers today, we mostly think of like 20 something like party girls in the 1920s, you know, with like rouge knees and rolled stockings. And 
a lot of jokes. Short skirts, short hair, you know, dancing the Charleston or whatever. What we, the general public, don't actually take into consideration is how this stereotype is actually just a really watered down and sexist hot take. It completely dismisses how young people of the 1920s pushed huge waves of social change forward within their society while coping with a lot of grief and trauma that we, unfortunately, are starting to really understand. The shift in hemlines and hairlines was in many respects just kind of like an outward reflection of a generation's reaction to the global trauma of the late 19-teens. That hot and bothered meltdown from the Ladies Home Journal just confirms that there was more to being a flapper than just wearing the fashionable dress of the moment. I mean, Shut ahead, or dropped waisted short skirts. Hell, the term flapper actually just went through multiple transformations over the course of the early like 20th century. Just a decade earlier, it basically was just a slang term for a like 14 year old girl. But in the 1920s, flapper was also associated with a wildly forward thinking and drastically different political and social viewpoints from earlier generations. They were not afraid to be antagonistic towards older generations and their ultra conservative opinions and practices. So what I'm saying here is that she was a drop wasted hell. Okay. So let's begin this comparison, shall we? The first part of the quote with jazz, short skirts, bobbed hair, glistening legs with the immodest passing of corsets with cigarette smoking with petting parties and gasoline buggy riding <laughs> while this whole section is basically just a typical like older generation going ugh the young people sort of attack and as an elder millennial here i am hyper sensitive to the infantilization of the younger generation, as well as the generational descriptions being used as broad sweeping general insults without any sort of nuance or self-reflection. See hipster for clarity. However, it does acknowledge practices and trends that are married in the 2020s by Gen Z. Gen Z, while there are trends and fads because fashion is what fashion is, is acutely non-conforming as a whole. And even anti-fashion is a sort of fashion in its own right. You know, it still has its changes and trends and nuances. This can be seen through the explosion of different types of aesthetics from e-girl to cottagecore, uh, gender nonconformity and exploration in dress, and just kind of the overall openness to try something new without a moment of hesitation. And this openness actually leads to a lot of like intergenerational comedy between like millennials and Gen Z. Because like the moment someone in Gen Z is like, oh my God, guys, let's wear low rise jeans and pluck our eyebrows off. And there's like some traumatized 35 year old with a glass of wine going, no! But it does also result in a lot of tension from socially conservative folks and older, even older generations, especially where gender and gender expression is concerned. So Harry Styles wearing that gorgeous gown and coat on the cover of Vogue magazine and like the ruckus it caused is a really good example of this. That cover will go down as an iconic representation of the 2020s, the open, honest, and fun exploration of fashion, gender, and that rejection of traditional and toxic masculinity, at least in my opinion. It's a huge signifier of how our society is and will continue to shift and change. It has a really big energy that comes with watching the world as we know it burn to the ground while holding our coffee like the dog and going, this is fine. I'm okay with the events that are unfolding currently. And it's that same energy that made the 1920s what it was. Let me explain. So gender expression and the breaking of traditional gender beauty norms was a huge part of the 1920s. The ideal body type for women at this time rejected that hyper feminine silhouette and shape from previous generations, favoring a much more boyish and straight sort of figure. The French term for flapper was garçons, basically femboys. Privet, when he wrote on Kajal, right. became famous for their garçons dresses, schoolgirl Colette style looks. And while this body type does exclude a lot of bodies, it, that doesn't mean that it still wasn't extremely revolutionary at the time. And while women cutting their hair short might not seem like as big of a deal today, at the time, it was a huge break away from traditional gender norms and beauty standards. Because women's hair, frankly, was and still is closely associated with 
feminine beauty ideals, and long hair equated to beauty, health, and femininity in the Western world, and frankly it still does in a lot of communities today. For reasons outside of health and hygiene, there's this rejection of traditional feminine beauty ideals and expectations of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. It also laid a lot of groundwork for future feminist movements and gender nonconformity in dress in the mid 20th century. The 1920s coincides with the beginning of society's acceptance, like general acceptance, of women wearing more masculine garments. Pants? I'm talking about pants right now. Damn! And I mean beyond the safety of sportswear and fashionable attire, the social acceptance of women wearing bifurcated garments in public places is actually relatively recent. My mom graduated in high school in 1971 and she wasn't allowed to wear pants to school. Title IX in the United States didn't pass until 1972. In the 2020s, regressive gender expectations make arguably the most difficulty for cisgendered men. Wait for it, hear me out. <laughs> in terms of being able to explore non-standard forms of dress, people perceived as female or non-binary who are usually more masculine presenting are lauded for dressing in traditionally masculine garments. While someone as famous as Harry Styles can't do a Vogue cover in a dress without getting completely blasted for it. Please stick to Armani menswear or at least pants. You look ridiculous. Hey guys. Bring back manly men. Patriarchal, misogynistic standards tell us that imitating men, whatever that means at the time, is the standard to strive for. But what Gen Z is doing is actively, enthusiastically, gleefully contesting those heavily gendered norms and expectations. Male presenting people are exploring their gender identities and breaking down restricting rules and barriers through dress, makeup, hairstyles, attitudes, nail polish, and other practices, styles, and garments that have traditionally been considered feminine and therefore off limits. We're seeing this also in the pivotal and significant movement to acknowledge a diversity of personal pronouns, as well as a general awareness of non-binary pronouns like they, them, and the gender and marriage neutral title of mix. This amazing destruction of the gender binary is something that I personally will always associate with Gen Z. And <laughs> while my generation was laughing at the hangover 10 years ago, Gen Z is out there pushing for a huge social change and progression. Now look, I'm not saying that older generations like my own didn't help lay the foundations for Gen Z or aren't actively participating in these movements because we absolutely are and we wouldn't be anywhere without Stonewall. What I am saying though is that Gen Z has taken this groundwork and ran with it, with that nihilistic enthusiasm that we can only dream of while popping three ibuprofens every day at 4 p.m. To give you like a historical comparison, recall the women's suffrage movement. It was only successful in the end due to the unflagging work of previous generations who bled, pleaded, and fought for white women's right to vote, which passed in the US in 1920. But it was the flappers of the 1920s that kind of took that progressive momentum and just ran with it with their own probably gin-flavored brand of nihilistic enthusiasm. So the 1920s and very early 1930s were the most sexually open and accepting years that we wouldn't see again as a society until the 1970s. Cities like Paris and Berlin were safe havens for queer communities. The first lesbian magazine was published in Berlin in 1924, and the first homosexual magazine was published in 1896 in Berlin. Drag balls were open public events. The Reichstag in Germany was going to fully decriminalize homosexuality in 1929, but the economic collapse that fall stopped the vote dead in its tracks. And then you have 1930s Germany. Up until then, the police just didn't enforce the law and like they just kind of didn't care about it. It's kind of like how New York City handled uh, marijuana use um, before the state completely legalized it. Um, like you could get a ticket if you were using it and you were caught by a cop, but ultimately no one cared and no one was really interested in prosecuting people for it. Snoop Dogg. You know with the Now, in the United States, both Gladys Bentley and Ma Rainey were relatively openly queer and gender non-conforming women who were both active just in the Harlem Renaissance, but were also very famous blues musicians in their own right. Their way of dressing, a shirt, waistcoat, coat, and top hat uh, with a skirt 
worn on their lower half was actually a sort of like sectorial code for a masked lesbian in Harlem. And this is according to Lillian Foderman. While the United States as a whole was more restricted than Europe, there were communities, Harlem being one, where queerness and sexual exploration was much more socially accepted. Now, if you want to learn more about Lillian's research, I've actually included a link to her interview below. It's um, yeah, like while previous generations like Gen X, Millennials, and Boomers fought for gay and trans rights, we also kind of became somewhat beholden to this kind of binary label. Like, are you gay or are you straight? Are you this or are you that? And I mean, like, I'm not even gonna get into like the whole bi erasure thing, okay? With Gen Z, we're seeing this kind of interesting blend of both rejecting labels, like the resurgence of the use of the term queer, uh, for example, is a really good one. It's both a label and not a label. It identifies the person outside of traditional cisgendered heteronormativity, but we don't exactly know in what way. They also are really good about identifying multiple different aspects of one's sexuality. The rise in discourse around asexuality, aromanticism, demisexual, etc. Moving on. My psychoanalyses encourage village follies and zigfeld chorus girls with one-piece bathing suits and so-called modernism in art. The first really big takeaway for me is uh, her calling out with psychoanalysis as the 19 teens and 20s were periods of huge growth in the studies of mental health, psychology, both with Carl Jung and Sigmund Freud making huge waves in the field during this time. And this emphasis on mental health is the same in the 2020s. The current public discussion around mental health is drastically different than what it was a few years ago, and Gen Z is a huge part of that. Their openness, their frankness, and lack of shame around mental health topics, seeking out therapy and discussing their own difficulties in public forums like TikTok, Tumblr, Reddit, etc., have had an enormous, enormous impact on removing the stigma around the discussion of mental health. I often get commended for my open honesty about discussing my own mental health. I need to be clear, that's really recent, guys. That's super recent. And the reason I am more comfortable talking about my mental health is because I saw Gen Z talking about it first. They gave me the confidence to talk about my mental health in a much more public and open and honest way. And while I'm still not comfortable going into some very personal details about my mental health and opening up about some struggles, where I am now has been greatly influenced by the younger generation. So thanks guys, love you. As for modernism and art, there's definitely some thinly veiled derision here. Not least because modernism wasn't just an art. Many people think of schools like the Bauhaus or Ulm, designers like Sonia Delaunay or Emily Floge. While a comparison of aesthetics has some possibility, I think a really useful connection to Gen Z is that modern design was not just about an aesthetic, but about revolutionizing the point and process of design itself. The Bauhaus, for example, wanted to unify the principles of mass production with individual artistic vision and strove to combine aesthetics with everyday function. I think Gen Z is pushing for that same exact sort of revolution in their care for the environment and their fight against fast fashion thrifting, upcycling, and concentrating on buying from brands that produce their products ethically and sustainably is a huge change that I see Gen Z are supporting. Retail, manufacturing, and the decorative arts are radically different now than what they were just a few years ago. And another damn thing. Can we just take a minute to acknowledge the other two like really well-known artistic movements of the 1920s that lean heavily into disassociative absurdity, Dadaism and surrealism. You know what else leans heavily into the absurd? My mom! Gen Z's mean game. So Gen Z's notably unique sense of humor. Um, it does evolve from millennial sense of from the millennial sense of humor and like our own jokes and our own meme culture, um, but it definitely has taken its own spin into the absurd. Uh, there's been a lot of discourse about this, YouTube videos, I've linked some down in the description below if you wanna learn more, but what is particularly of interest is just how much Gen Z le leans into the absurd. And I mean, we see this in memes, we see this in TikToks, we see this in YouTube even. Uh, if you think about Emma Chamberlain's old style of editing. Thank you for listening, let's watch the video. Hopefully you like it, and I. I love you regardless, even if you hate it. Okay, enjoy. I just threw up a little bit. Or even Makira Tours' current style of editing. So cold. I tried. There is a level of absurdity to it that makes it funny.
that makes it engaging. It's, it's, it, and it speaks to the moment that we're in right now. And while, yeah, 1920s was in response to World War I and the Spanish flu, 2020, it's the same thing, you know? Like, we're reacting to very similar global responses. Now, the only difference is, is while well, the 1920s and surrealism and Dadaism went a little bit more into the highbrow art, like painting, sculpture, and poetry and film, you know, today we have it more in our humor. Da, 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 da. Yeah. Exactly what is that? Camp Rock! Now for the final piece of this anti-flapper rant. With the exposing and slandering of old fogies, with birth control and eugenics, with Bolshevism, both the parlor variety and the Russian experiment, or with anything else that the newspapers happened to be full of in the elder generation of the ultra-conservative sort didn't approve. Exposing and slandering of old fogies. <laughs> That's modern cancel culture, baby. Or in its healthier form, accountability culture. While there's a lot to unpack and discuss around cancel culture, because it's complex, nuanced, and ever-evolving, I will not be talking about that today, but the push to hold our communities accountable while unpacking outdated and harmful modes of thinking and rhetoric is an important part of the 2020s push to create a much more inclusive and holistic society free from white supremacy, colonialist systems, and patriarchal practices. And I gotta say, Gen Z is absolutely killing it in this department. Now to be absolutely clear, the eugenics movement of the early 20th century was incredibly racist, ableist, and caused generational trauma to marginalized folks. Hitler did use eugenics as one of his excuses for trying to justify the Holocaust, which killed millions of Jews, Romani, queer, and other non-conforming folks. Eugenics is not, and will never be, acceptable. And while the connection between eugenics and the birth control movement is both unfortunate and complicated, history will forever exist in shades of gray. The existence of eugenics does not mean that the birth control movement hasn't done incredible things for society. The discourse that began in the late 19-teens and 1920s about birth control, separate from eugenics, is still having a positive impact on sexual health today and it's something that we are still fighting for in the United States. Margaret Sanger, the activist who coined the term birth control, was advocating for white women's sexual health and safe birth control in the 1920s. Her arguments for birth control are not drastically different than the conversations that we're seeing today on social media, especially with how the birth rate is dropping in first world countries. Her racism is also very well documented. And while she did do a lot of good for women's health, we also need to acknowledge that she also caused a great deal of harm to some women, particularly those in communities of color. Now, in the Birth Control Review, the arguments for and discussions around birth control are similar to our own. Overpopulation leading to food shortages, poverty and quality of life, women's mental health and physical health. Just trigger warning here, if you go and read these, suicide is actively discussed in the birth control review. These same topics are the ones that I, a 30-something year old woman, still actively participate in. While the average age for the first time mother has steadily increased over the years, so much so that most of Gen Z are not at that stage of life yet, the importance of sexual health, autonomy, and access to safe birth control is hugely important for all genders. And since eugenics and birth control aren't controversial enough, the magazine now brings up Bolshevism. <laughs> Communism. Now, I personally can't help but to equate the parlor variety to the memification of communism on TikTok and Twitter. The worker sinks to the level of a commodity and becomes indeed the most wretched of commodities. Karl Marx. And obviously the genuine growth of leftist political ideology amongst young people who were, many of whom were born after the collapse of the USSR and the Berlin Wall. Overall, this is telling as part of the movement in both eras to be inclusive and not exclusive. Rebelling against rich old fogies, <clears throat> oligarchs, like Rockefeller and Hearst, or in our case, Bezos and Musk, wanting national health care, access to free education, and the resurgence of unions and workers' rights is a sign that our young people care for others and not just themselves. Gen Z is both nihilistic and deeply empathetic towards the world and their fellow people. Envisioning a bleak future seems to make people fight even harder for something better. And that's probably part of communism's current lore. It's a 
kind of utopian vision. And then we also know how utopian attempts happen. With anything else that the newspapers happen to be full of and the elder generation of the ultra-conservative sort didn't approve. No, they don't approve, do they? Well, I think it's really easy for us to separate ourselves from the past and pretend that we're somehow unique or special in our existence. This magazine article, to me, proves that we're not actually really that different from previous generations. That history is short, that global traumatic experiences seem to actually have a similar effect on youth culture, artistic expression, and frankly, nihilistic outlooks on life. So maybe we can all take comfort in that. Or maybe this video has sh shook a few to your core. Either way, at least we're not alone in these feelings. And as for Gen Z, keep doing what you're doing, you fabulous <laughs> flapper generation, yo. And if you like hanging out with me, don't forget to subscribe. I post every other Sunday. And if you liked this video, go ahead and give it a thumbs up. I know that sounds really corny. I know it does. But hear me out. It does actually help me as a creator and it helps you as a viewer too. So that way YouTube knows what kind of videos to send you. So with that, I hope you all have a lovely rest of your week and I'll see you back here next time. Bye. Funding for this program was made possible from viewers like you. Thanks again to Ritual for sponsoring this video. Who's the babies? Who's the babies? Who's the babies? Hi. Someone smells like cake. Probably don't want the champagne bottle. It's not really champagne, it's five gallon bubbles and cold.